People love transformation. Taking something that is ugly, making it beautiful. Taking something that is plain and making it special. So it could be to do with your hair, or it might be um, to do with your dress sense, or your skin, or your body shape, or maybe it's to do with your house or your garden. So many things where we love to see change. And if you think about it, um, if you look at adverts, which I rarely do, but if you do, they're full of this, aren't they? Full of selling products that promise change. Or programs uh, devoted to change. Or, or think of the vast amounts of money and time that our society spends on these things. So imagine what it would be like to have something that could bring about an even better and permanent and lasting transformation. Something even better than making the old young or the ugly beautiful. And imagine it came free of charge. There's no cost at all. It comes as a gift. Well, you can stop imagining because there is such a thing. And this is the amazing thing that we're reading this morning. There is such a thing. And we could call it, as the Bible does, the gospel, which simply means good news, which is a, about the biggest understatement ever. Good news. This is the most fantastic news ever in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we are looking at this morning in this wonderful passage in Ephesians 2. It's one of the clearest, most wonderful expressions of the gospel, the good news in the whole of the New Testament. And this passage is going to speak to all of us this morning. God is going to speak to us. If we're not a Christian, we're going to hear about exactly what God is offering us in Christ what it will mean to put our trust in him and to receive this gift from God. If we are a Christian, this will remind us wonderfully of what God has done for us and continues to do for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be reminded of our great purpose and the privilege we have of being a follower of the Lord Jesus. And of course, this morning, we're not talking about a physical transformation, at least not fundamentally, although it does involve that ultimately. We're talking about spiritual transformation, a transformation within, in our hearts. Knowing peace rather than being anxious and fearful. Knowing love rather than hatred knowing innocence rather than guilt and knowing freedom rather than slavery and as we think about this good news message this morning we need to come first to some bad news we need to understand why we need this why we need change because if we don't realise that we need change, we probably won't accept the offer. So in the first three verses, Paul talks about our great need for change, great need for spiritual transformation. And our heading here, if I can summarise what he's saying, dead, enslaved and condemned by nature dead enslaved condemned by nature now the good, the good news is coming but we do need to dwell here a bit longer dr marson lloyd jones a great preacher from the last century used to say that before we could accept the lord jesus before we could receive the gift he offers 
He needs to take us on a guided tour of the dungeons of our soul. Now that doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? A guided tour of the dungeons of our soul. But we need to go on this tour. It's not a comfortable ride, but it's a necessary one to really grasp why we need the gospel at all. And then to understand the wonders of the gospel as we grasp our need for it. So let's do that just briefly in these verses 1 to 3. The first thing we see as we go on the tour down below into our souls, the dungeons, we see that by nature we are dead. Verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. We're dead if by nature. But that means spiritually dead, dead towards God. So we might be very alive in all sorts of ways. We might have a very lively body, lots of energy, like an athlete. Or maybe we've got a very lively mind, like a scholar. Or maybe we've got a very lively personality, very bubbly and uh, charismatic, like a comedian. But Paul is saying that we may be alive in these sorts of ways, but at the core of our being, in our souls, by nature, we are dead. Without Jesus, we have no sensitivities towards God, at least to the true God. We may have religious inclinations, we may have spiritual inclinations. People often say, I'm a spiritual person. But these are towards false gods and false spiritualities. There, there's no inclination by nature to the true God, to true worship, to true godly living. We are by nature cut off from the true and living God. And we have no inclination of our own to move towards him. Secondly, as well as being dead, Paul says we are enslaved by nature. Verses 2 and 3. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So Paul is saying here that by nature we are enslaved to an unholy trinity. We often say the world, the flesh and the devil. An unholy trinity. Verse 2, first part, enslaved to the world. Now, by world, Paul means uh, the structures, the people around us, which stand in opposition to God, that, that propagate godless values. So in our society, we might think of secular politics, um, the media that pumps out so many godless uh, influences on our society. We might think of the education system and so on. By nature, without Christ, we are enslaved to the agenda set by our culture, one which is largely now secular and even anti-Christian. And by nature, we just simply follow these values. We buy into the system. We live according to its ways and standards. We're also slaves to the devil by nature, Paul says. Verse 2, second part, he calls the devil there the prince of the power of the air. And this is a shocking thing if you think about it. You don't need to be a Satanist to follow the devil. In fact, that's our natural disposition as human beings, Paul is saying. 
By nature, without Christ, the devil is our master. And he's such a clever being that he can be our master without us even realizing it. He deceives. Uh, he has such control over people's lives that they can be completely unaware even of his existence. He makes sin seem attractive. The very thing that kills us, he makes attractive and pleasing. He makes Christ seem irrelevant and faith in him unattractive. The very person, the only person who can save us, he subtly gets us to despise. And then verse 3, there's also a slavery to our own flesh, or as some <coughs> translations put it, our sinful nature. Here we have an inner slavery to the desires and the passions within which are not godly. Paul is not talking here about natural bodily desires like um, for food and rest and for sexual in intimacy. There's nothing wrong with hunger and weariness and libido. But what our flesh, as Paul calls it, subtly does is to pervert these natural feelings. And it, it turns them into greed, turns hunger into greed. It turns a natural desire for rest into laziness and a natural desire for sexual intimacy into lust. And then there are all sorts of perversions of the mind, Paul says, as well as the body such as envy and pride and, and false ambition. And all these sinful tendencies within enslave us, trap us into wrong thoughts and wrong behaviour patterns. And so we are spiritually dead by nature, enslaved, to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And finally, Paul says, we are also condemned by nature. End of verse 3. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. John Stott, a Bible commentator, describes God's wrath in this way. It is God's personal, righteous, constant hostility to evil his settled refusal to compromise with it, and his resolve instead to condemn it. Now, if you think about it, we wouldn't want it any other way. We wouldn't want a God who didn't care about the evils and the injustices of our world. We want a God who cares. We want a God who brings people to account who should be brought to account. He doesn't just sweep evil under the carpet. But the problem for us is that if God should condemn the evil in others, he should also condemn the evil in us. And because we are by nature dead to God, because of our spiritual rebellion and failure, and because by nature we're enslaved to the world, the flesh and the devil, we are also by nature objects of God's just and holy anger towards sin in us. By nature we're dead, by nature we're enslaved, by nature we stand condemned before a holy God. And this is all of us. This problem is universal across the world, across history. It affects people who are obviously wicked in society's eyes, but it also affects people who are respectable, even religious, in people's eyes. I quite like the story of Arthur Conan Doyle, who was the author of the Sherlock Holmes novels. And he loved to play practical jokes on his friends. And uh, at one time he decided to, as a joke, write to 12 of his good friends 
with the message, your secret is out. And he had no idea um, that they had any secrets to hide, but he just thought, I wonder what would happen if I just put that message out. And the result was nearly all of them fled. They all had something to hide to flee and they wanted to flee. Everyone knows there are problems in our world and in our lives, but most people think the solution is better laws or better education, or maybe a bit more effort to be a better person. And these are all good things, but they don't get to the heart of the problem. What we're seeing here is the problem is so deep and so impossible that we need a solution that, can't, that doesn't come from us, but comes from above. We need a solution from God. And that's what we're turned to now as we come to the good news. Verses four to seven. And I've called this alive, enthroned and loved by grace. Alive, enthroned and loved by grace. Did you notice the awfulness of our problem is matched by the wonderfulness of the solution in Christ? And did you notice that it's all from God, these verses four to seven? It's all God's initiative, it's all God's work. And it had to be because we were dead. Now dead people can't do a lot, can they? Can't do anything. And so salvation must come from God, from first to last. And salvation is focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. It centers on him. And it centers on us being united with Christ. As we're united with him, we share his victory over sin and death. So look with me at verse five. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. We're united with Christ in his resurrection. And through his resurrection, we are brought back to life when we become a Christian. Verse six, God raised us up with him, with Christ. That's talking about Jesus' ascension into heaven. And as we're united with him, we are lifted up. And look at where we are. Are lifted to verse 6 again and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus so we're united with him in his resurrection in his ascension and as it's called in his session which means he's seated and we are seated with him in the heavenly places now, this is a profound thing. We're seated right here and now with Christ in the heavenly places. So we're not just sat in a school hall. We are sat with the Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenly realms. Now, this isn't for the future only. This is for now. What does that mean? Because clearly we're not in heaven, we're not in the new creation yet, we're not in the new heaven and earth. We're still in this old world order. Well, I think we get to what Paul is talking about at the end of chapter 1. Look with me at verse 20 of chapter 1. We're told that God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So that's where Christ is. But look at what that means, verse 21. It means that Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. 
In other words, it means Jesus is seated on the throne. It means he's in a position of complete authority and rule over the whole universe, over all evil powers. And this is the wonderful truth that if we are Christians, if we're united with Christ, then we share in his reign, we share in his kingship, in his rule today. That means we're no longer mastered and ruled and enslaved by evil powers. We are enthroned with Jesus above those evil powers. Now, that's not to say we don't struggle with evil, because we do. We still struggle within and without. But it does mean that we're no longer dominated and mastered by such forces. It means we already share in the victory over them in Christ. Now, just marvel for a moment at how what God has done perfectly addresses our problem. Verse 1, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 5, we've now been made alive in Christ. Verse 2 and 3, we were enslaved by evil forces. Now, verse 6, we're enthroned with Christ over them. Verse 3 at the end, we were children of wrath. <coughs> Verse 4, we are now recipients of love. This is a truly amazing transformation that Paul's talking about. This is not just about making skin beautiful. This is about making our hearts and souls right with God. If you like, uh, uprooting all the evil within and making us pure and clean. And it's all by grace, notice. It's all because of God's unmerited favour. We don't deserve this at all. But in Christ, there is love, there is mercy, there's new life, there's victory by his grace. Notice the emphasis on grace, verse 5. By grace you have been saved, verse 7, the, the immeasurable riches of his grace. Verse 8, by grace you have been saved. So, dead, enslaved, condemned by nature, but in Christ, alive, enthroned, and loved by grace. And so as we finish our last heading, verses 8 to 10, this is our response. How do we respond? The response Paul is calling us to is faith, not works. That's our last heading. Faith, not works. I don't know if you've seen the film Saving Private Ryan. If you haven't, it's not for the squeamish. And I don't necessarily recommend it, um, but it has a tremendously graphic opening scene. It depicts the D-Day landings in France at the end of World War II. And by the end of the invasion, the sea is red with blood. One of those killed on the beach is Private Sean Ryan. And the war office discovers that his brothers, Peter and Daniel, have also been killed in action. And the next scene in the film then goes to their mother at home in the UK, collapsing as she receives the tragic news about her three sons. But then it's discovered that the youngest son, the fourth son, James, has been parachuted down 15 miles behind enemy lines in Normandy. And so eight men led by Captain John Miller are ordered to go and get James Ryan out because his mother must not lose her last remaining son. And the film basically shows how one by one those eight men lose their lives on this rescue mission. 
However, James Ryan is rescued in the end. And in the final battle scene of the film, the captain, John Miller, dies on the bridge. And as he dies, he whispers his last words to a stunned Ryan. James, earn it, earn it. And the film then fast forwards 50 years to an elderly James Ryan back in Normandy with his wife, children and grandchildren. And he's kneeling beside the grave of that same captain, John Miller. And he says, weeping, every day I think of what you said to me on that bridge. Earn it, earn it. And I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope that at least in your eyes, I've earned what all of you have done for me. And then he turns to his wife and says rather pathetically, tell me I've led a good life. Tell me I've been a good man. It's obvious that James Ryan has spent the whole of his life with those last words of his rescuer around his neck like a lead weight, earn this. Has the quality of his life really justified the death of his rescuers? Has he earned it? Does he deserve it? As one soldier says in the film, do the mothers of the men who died to rescue him think that he has earned their son's death? Well, when it comes to God and his son, Jesus Christ, the message is so different. Jesus, God's son, also came on a rescue mission to save us. He also gave up his life on a cross so that we could live. But the wonderful thing about the gospel is not that the message is we've got to somehow earn what Jesus did for us. But the message is we've simply got to receive what he did. We don't earn it, we don't merit it. We receive it by faith, it's a gift. We just open our, our, our arms and say, thank you. And we don't have this lead weight over our shoulders all through our lives, wondering if we've lived a good enough life or not. But we know that by his grace, we are forgiven. And we're saved not by what we do or how good a life we live, but we're saved by his grace by his blood, which cleanses us from every sin. And so Paul says these wonderful words in verse eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this isn't of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Do you see Paul is saying the same thing in different ways to, so we get the point. It's not by what we do. It's not how we work. It's not whether we've lived a good enough life. It's by faith. It's by grace. That's how we're saved. And that's the response that God looks for in us. Simply faith. Now, that doesn't mean as a Christian we, we can just live as we want. We can just sort of carry on with our wickedness. Actually, if we're really a Christian, we won't want to carry on with our wickedness. Verse 10 tells us that when we come to God in faith, God gets to work in our hearts to remake us. So we actually want to do good. Uh, we don't want to sin. We don't want to do evil. God has good things for us to do as Christians, good works prepared for us in advance. And the wonderful thing is, is you become a Christian, you actually want to do these things. We don't always get it right, of course, but there's a joy in living God's way and pleasing God and living a good life in his strength. So good works don't save us. Good works are an expression of true faith 
and genuine salvation. Good works are not the roots of salvation. They're the fruit, the outworkings of the grace that God has shown us. So here's the wonderful transforming work of God on offer for each of us. May we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and may we see him transforming us day by day until at last we stand before him blameless and faultless and perfect in glory forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that in a world and in our, in our lives that are marked by bad news so often, thank you that there is wonderful news, eternally wonderful news. Thank you that we've heard that news this morning. Maybe we've heard it for the first time. Maybe we've been reminded but Lord, may this good news sink into our souls this morning of what you have done in Christ and the gift of salvation that you offer to everyone. And Lord, I pray that for each of us, you would help us to receive this gift by faith. Help us to put our trust in Jesus, to unite our hearts with his, that we can know this wonderful salvation in our lives and that we will know it more and more deeply, more and more wonderfully, that the transformation that you've already started would become deeper and more profound and more wonderful. That as Paul says, even though outwardly we're wasting away, may we inwardly be being renewed day by day until we stand before your throne and are welcomed into your eternal kingdom. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to do the good works that you have already prepared for us to do, that you would show us what they are, that you would give us joy in doing them and strength to do them. And we pray this for Jesus' sake and for your glory. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Let's sing of that wonderful news. <laughs>